okay today it's good to see you we're looking at John William uh, Bergen or affectionately known as Dean Bergen I'm reading it from this book it's an old book and he was a uh, monumental in scholarship in textual criticism of the 19th century uh, no man intra has ades semper venerandum these words taken from the inscription under Cardinal Worsley's bust a quadrangle of Christ Church may not unsuitably be prefixed to an article on Dean Bergen in the quarterly review within these precincts if anywhere the Dean's name is to be held in respectful remembrance with this review his relations were long and intimate to those responsible for its conduct he was bound by ties of mutual regard John William Bergen was born on August the 21st, 1813. His father, Mrs. Bergen, was a merchant of London and paternally his descent was purely English. But his mother, Catherine de Cranmer, was the daughter of the Austrian consul at Smyrina by a Miss Maltus, a lady who had Greek at Simronet blood in her veins and a sister of that, Mrs. Baldwin, whose beauty created a sensation both in Vienna and in London, procured for her attentions from the Prince of Wales, afterwards George IV, and elicited even from Dr. Johnson a burst of clumsy amorousness, and whose portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, formerly in the collection of Strawberry Hill, was the spring sold by Mrs. by Mercers. Mr. Thomas Bergen was a high Tory and a high uh, and a high churchman and antiquary and connoisseur. He dealt in Greek and Turkish produce, and the nature of his business obliged him to write, reside for several years at Smyrina, where his eldest son, John William, was born. But shortly after the boy's birth, he returned to England, and London was henceforth his home. John William Bergen, during the first eleven years of his life, was taught by his mother. In 1824, he was sent to a private school at Putney, and subsequently to one at Blackheath. We do not find that he has made any special proficiency in classical study but he was a thoughtful and precocious boy in fact was suspect not a little of a prig reviewing at the age of 20 on one some records of his school days he says i noticed the same love of books and of study the same hatred of school and contempt for the society of my equals in age which since i was 11 and first went to school i have never been able to shake off from early days his mind was of a seriously though not emotionally religious cast. At the age of sixteen he was confirmed and it is curious to find that though he was constant in his attendance at church he only communicated twice in the next five years. What makes this fact the more remarkable is that at this period his heart was set on taking holy orders though the fulfilment of this design was unavoidably deterred. Difficulties destined before long to be fatal were beginning to gather round his father's business and it became necessary for young Bergen instead of proceeding to Oxford or Cambridge to enter the paternal counting house he disliked it more than I can tell writes his sister and found relief only in the pursuit of poetry and art during his leisure moments when he t returned from the city these scanty intervals of leisure he used with praiseworthy diligence he attended lectures at the University of London, worked hard at archaeology and kindred studies, published a considerable number of fugitive pieces, both in prose and verse, and one work of more pretentious, a historical treatise on the life and times of Sir Thomas Gresham. Meanwhile, he had the advantage of early and frequently access to the Society of Literary of Men, whom he met at his father's table, and his annual holiday were occupied in excursions which seemed generally to have the, had historical or archaeological research for the subject. A visit paid to Mr. Dawson Turner at Yarmouth in April 1838 had, however, an interest of a different kind, and we gather from his biographer's hint that it was only the constraining sense of domestic duty, that it was only the constraining sense of domestic duty, and the absolute ne necessity of trying to relieve his father's embarrassed finances that restrained him from offering marriage to his horse daughter. As some ten years rolled by, and the skies were darkened for a storm, it broke on August 19th, 1841, when Thomas Bergen's house suspended payment and bankruptcy ensued. The crash of his father's fortune proved an un unspeakable blessing to John William Bergen. 
It terminated his commercial career at a stroke and left him free to follow the bent of his own inclinations. He had long desired to go to Oxford with a view to seeking holy orders, and that this desire was now fulfilled. On August 23rd, 1841, he wrote to his friend, to Dr. Dawson Turner, who had generously offered him pecuniary aid. My backwardness in Greek, especially in what you would not believe, and indeed my ignorance generally is frightful, he said. On October 21st, 1841, Bergen matriculated at Oxford as a commoner of Worcester College, having chosen the society on the commendation of Dr. Pusey, whose brother-in-law, Dr. Cotton, was its provost. Owing to domestic engagements connected with the winding up of his father's affairs and his family removal from the old home, he did not begin residence at Oxford till the following year. Once established there, he threw himself with a characteristic earnestness into his new life and was equally attentive to the religious and educational duties of the place. And so Bergen went on to be one of the great scholars of the 19th century, especially in the area of textual criticism. He was so brilliant that he was basically one of the main authorities in, in that period of history. Uh, his scholarship has generally been forgotten now and it needs to be revived so I'll put a link to some of his work and I would encourage you as a scholar to revisit Bergen and revisit some of his ideas because they need to be reintroduced to textual criticism and uh, I hope that you would uh, do that as a scholar in textual criticism if you are. Thank you for listening and take care.